This magnificent vessel, the original Royal Research Ship Discovery, built in 1901, was an embodiment of national enterprise. For nearly four years, this room, barely 15 foot square, the wardroom, surrounded by cabins, served as working, dining, living and meeting accommodation to 12 intrepid scientific explorers on their journeys into the history books of mankind. The icy chill on the morning of the 23rd of October 1901 did nothing to prevent crowds gathering on the dockside to see her set sail. She was captained by Robert Scott, who merely three years before had been a poor, struggling lieutenant in the British Navy. His life was to change drastically when he was asked by Sir Clement Markham, the president of the Royal Geographical Society, to lead Britain's pioneering expedition to that most solitary and desolate of places, the South Pole. At the conception of the expedition, no existing ship had a hull strong enough to stand the intense pressure of being trapped in the polar winter ice for up to five months. And so it was that RRS Discovery came to be specially designed. Built and launched in Dundee, she was to break her way through the polar ice as far as possible, spending the winter trapped while Scott and his team explored the icy wilderness and carried out scientific research. Only the spring thaw would see the ship's release and the crew's return. Unknown land masses were mapped, and many advances made in glaciology, terrestrial magnetism, and marine biology. But they were to exact their price, for eventually Scott and four of his team lost their lives. RRS Discovery had embodied the spirit of the time, pioneering, relentless, and enduring. She was to continue her scientific service for many years and was eventually retired in 1925. The RRS Discovery of today, the second since the 1901 ship, sails on in the great tradition of its forebear. Most modern ships are built to have a lifespan of 20 to 25 years. The present Discovery, seen here entering her home base of Barry in September 1990, as she was originally built in 1962, would therefore normally be considered to be in the twilight of her useful life. The options for the future role of a ship of Discovery's size were carefully considered. The estimated cost of converting Discovery was about half that of a new ship, and so the decision was taken to completely modernize the present ship. A project on this scale is not routine and rarely tried with complete success. Successfully completed, the project would enable the United Kingdom to continue playing a leading role in international marine and biological research well into the 21st century. In short, the project would entail removing her existing superstructure, stripping out her engines and interior, leaving her for an instant as a mere hulk. Her hull would then be sliced through and her massive bow section drawn forward to allow the insertion of a new 11-metre section. Welded back together, the lengthened hull would then support a sleek, newly built superstructure and interior, new engines and control systems, and new state-of-the-art scientific laboratories 
and other facilities. The pretty tourist town of Viana do Castelo lies on the coast of northern Portugal at the mouth of the Rio Lima. Such a location may seem to be an unlikely venue for a sophisticated technological shipbuilding feat of this nature. The Portuguese, however, have a long tradition of boat building and a history as a great seafaring nation. Viana do Castelo, besides being a home for traditional wooden boat building by hand, boasts a large and modern shipyard, the Esteleros Naves de Viana do Castelo. In competition with many others, this shipyard won the contract for the first such conversion and modernization of a British scientific vessel, and Viana was to become the temporary home for many NERC and other British personnel involved in the project. RRS Discovery entered Viana on the 26th of October 1990 for the beginning of her metamorphosis, benignly watched over by the ancient church of Santa Lucia, perched on the towering hill above the shipyard. The initial stages of the modernization involved cutting the superstructure into a number of sections before removal by giant cranes. The ship then needed to be dry docked with special arrangements for the later slipping forward of the bow section. This was to be achieved by placing the ship on top of a sandwich of steel plates with a liberal filling of grease between them. Before this could be achieved, the ship was stripped down and the old engines removed, their rhythmic pounding silenced for the last time. The slow and painstaking stage of cutting the hull in two then took place prior to what turned out to be the most hazardous operation of all. The time has come to draw the bow section of the hull forward. Work in the shipyard has come to a stop as the 1,500 strong workforce sense that corporate need for attention and support. Faces of the engineers, workforce and discovery personnel show anxiety and tension as the first creaks and groans of the rebirth of the ship rent the air. The operation is not going well, and the bow section skews towards the dockside. The hawsers tighten to attempt to bring her back into alignment. Again, the sound of excruciating pain rents the air. The crane master shouts his instructions, they are misheard, and the ship skews further to the dockside. A gasp of disbelief rising from the assembled workforce signals a halt to the operation while stock is taken. The ship is now in a dangerous position and work must stop whilst jacking is used to try to re-stabilize and realign the bow section. A further three days pass by before the bow section is successfully drawn forward. At this stage the metamorphosis is at its most critical the chrysalis at its most vulnerable. This once great ship is now no more than a worthless hulk, and if anything were to go wrong, she would be worth next to nothing. The operation continues slowly and painstakingly with the insertion of the new 11 meter center section of the hull. Two massive cranes drop the section gently into place. Work can now begin to make a hole again. The sound of renting metal steals through the dock once more as massive jacks cajole her bow backwards to meet the new center section. These complicated maneuvers have left the bow section slightly out of line with the rest of the ship and further corrective work must be done before welding the hull whole once more. Not only has the hull been lengthened but the aft end has been cut away and a new wider winged structure fitted in its place. 
This will allow more room for carriage and deployment of large scientific equipment. It is early September 1991. That's there. Have you got the manifold for it? For the team of engineers, designers and scientists that have nursed this project through some demoralizing problems, there is a sense of something new, a sense of starting again, of something positive and achievable, of something they are about to create. Morale is high. Awaiting in storage from the UK are the four massive engines that will beat as the heart of the new ship. Built by Merley's Blackstone, and here seen being tested at their plant in Stamford, Lincolnshire in April 1991, before dispatch to Portugal, they will generate between them 3,570 kilowatts of power. The new lengthened hull is ready to receive the new engines, for these must be lowered into place in a dangerous and precise operation. For the most part, all goes well, but not without the inevitable adrenaline-producing snag. Whilst this operation is taking place, the shaft that will transmit power to the massive phosphor bronze screw undergoes re-metalling and balancing to ensure vibration-free and quiet propulsion. If the engines are the heart of the ship, then the brain of the ship, four banks of state-of-the-art automatic control panels built by Hill Graham, follow the engines for installation deep into the hull before work can begin on the new decks and superstructure. The electrical automatic control system, built and tested at Hill Graham's plant in High Wycombe in mid-1991, automatically provides alternating current power in response to demand from engines, winch gear or scientific instrumentation. Building the new streamlined superstructure in modular form has been continuing in parallel to the work on the hull for some time now, in another part of the yard. The lengthened hull, complete with engines and control gear installed, is ready to receive the new superstructure. Two massive cranes maneuver the new hangar over the main deck into position. Whilst the operation looks relatively simple, a number of problems arise in marrying up old with new. Excitement builds as the sleek lines of the new structure start to form. The new designer-style bridge is finally in position and one person is determined to be the first to stand on it. Perhaps it may be said that all great projects are the creation of an individual, however many people help in that endeavour. For Robin Williams, standing alone on the bridge of his recreation, for a few minutes, many emotions, many memories flood in. Birth is seldom without pain, but for all that, the overriding emotion at this moment is one of great pride. This is the culmination of months of preparatory work back in the United Kingdom and later in Portugal. Many share in that pride. The team of marine architects and engineers who designed the new discovery, who faced innumerable problems and came up with solutions. The scientists who must help the Portuguese understand the complexities of scientific wiring, for instance, for which there is no shipyard expertise. Paul Stone, the project director, charged with ensuring the success of the project. Frank Verdon, the superintending officer, for whom this is a very special project, because it is his last before retiring from a long and distinguished career. And many others, both British and Portuguese, whose day-to-day -day commitment to the project helps to ensure success. It is October 1991. A wet and windy dawn heralds the coming of winter. Rain clouds shroud the watchful gaze of Santa Lucia. Today, the developing vessel must support herself once more. It is a crucial day for all involved. It is time for her to be refloated. A last check of her underside takes place as the sea begins to trickle into the dock. Check after check is made as the water rises inexorably until almost imperceptibly the moment she becomes afloat takes place. All is well, and all are pleased. The dry dock gate opens, and the unfinished ship looks out to sea once more. A tug nurtures her gently from dry dock to another berth, where her rejuvenation will be completed. <laughs> 